Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at the Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake released in 2003. We've covered a lot of remakes on this channel, a couple of which were also produced by Michael Bay's Platinum Dunes, just like this one was. But you may be surprised to learn that the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was the first major reboot of the horror genre. Sure, there have always been remakes, and some of them came out before this movie. But this was the first reboot of a major horror franchise, and it'd be followed the next year by Zack Snyder's Dawn of the Dead. After that, it was off to the remake races, and we got a solid decade of non-stop reimaginings of horror classics. Although the tide has been stemmed in recent years, they do in fact continue to this very day. Remakes can be a mixed bag, and I notoriously have a reputation of being pretty hard on them. After all, originality is something I put a high value on, and I often don't see the point of remaking something that's already been made. But horror fans tend to like this movie, and I can agree that as far as remakes, makes go, it's not bad. It does a nice job balancing nods to the original with fresh new ideas, and Arlie Ermey's performance as the nasty Sheriff Hoyt feels right at home in the pantheon of sadistic Sawyer family members. Although, on that note, for whatever reason, the Sawyers have been renamed the Hewitts for this timeline. This remake's respect for the original is further reinforced by the fact that Toby Hooper and Kim Hankel, who wrote the first film, serve as co-producers here, and Daniel Pearl, who shot the original, returns as cinematographer. Not only did this movie kick off the era of reboots, it also started the trend of having super intense gore and violence in the genre, in contrast to the more teen-targeted films that had come out in the wake of Scream. Remember, this was actually before Saw and Hostel, which came out in 2004 and 2005 respectively, so audiences weren't exactly used to the dirty bloody scenes this remake wanted to show them. Still, I can't bring myself to love this movie. Even though it looks great and has solid practical effects, it ends up feeling like a parade of brutality without any of the dark humor or documentary-like grittiness that made the original so interesting. It's fine enough, but ultimately feels to me like an unnecessary remake. Stop me if you've heard this one before. Will Leatherface and his new Hewitt family get more kills than the Sawyers and Slaughters of yesteryear? Let's find out and get to them. The movie begins with faux gritty footage of a crime scene and some familiarity. Namely, John Larroquette reprising his role as intro voiceover guy. For them, an idyllic summer afternoon became a nightmare. And, you know it, you love it, that Jumpin' Jack flashbulb sound effect. Larroquette talks about evidence collected at the Hewitt house and cues up some footage of a police officer doing a crime scene walkthrough. Yeah, take a look at that watch, mofo, cause it's time for a title card! It's 1973, apparently, even though Jessica Biel is the most 2003 looking woman I've ever seen. Oh well, at least this dude's being faithful with that disco stew style. Biel plays Aaron, a run-of-the-mill final girl who's got a boyfriend named Kemper who looks like he's on leave from the Nostromo right now. They're on their way to a Leonard Skinner concert concert with their friends Morgan and Andy, that dirty Owen Wilson fella over there, who's currently swapping spit and sweat with Pepper, a hitchhiker who they've only just met. Didn't even know each other yesterday? After a bunch of bubble blowing and pinata pecking, and recreating shots from the original, they nearly hit a woman who's walking in the middle of the road, muttering to herself that she wants to get away. She wants to fly away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Concerned for her safety, they adopt her into their hippie mobile, where she proves to be a real bummer of a van guest. They're all dead. After she makes them pull over, saying they're going the wrong way, things follow this franchise's hitchhiker rule of thumb and manage to get real weird real fast. Like, whoa, how'd she have that thing up there the whole time? We just saw her stand up a second ago and that gun didn't fall out? I don't even think I want to know. I kind of want to know, though. We don't learn anything from the hitchhiker, though, because with one last eerie proclamation, You're all gonna die. She adds herself to the kill count in a shockingly violent death that ends up having one of the absolute coolest shots I've ever seen in a horror movie. The friggin' camera dollies out backwards through the hole in her head? Are you kidding me? God damn, that is an awesome shot, and probably the best part of this movie. Even cooler is that they did the whole effect practically. Actress Lauren German used an air gun in her mouth while they shot a blood gun off behind her head, and the camera actually went through a dummy made by Greg Nicotero that also
also had to move on a track. They had to try a whole bunch of times to get the take, but director Marcus Nispel insisted they get it, and I'm so glad that he did. Everyone rightfully freaks out about what they just saw and reluctantly drive the body to a gas station slash barbecue joint slash general store where they report the suicide to Luda May, the proprietor here, who really needs to invest in some fly paper. Ain't no one gonna buy her pig head if it's covered in flies. Luda May calls the town sheriff, who says that he wants to meet the kids at a nearby mill. What the hell, sheriff? These kids ain't postmates for corpses. Post living mates? No, corpse mates. The directions to the sheriff's meeting mill involve driving over a field and through the woods. Wait, is it to grandmother's mill we go? Grandmother's mill appears to be as dead as Grandma Sawyer, which is to say, very. While the kids wait for this mystery sheriff to arrive, something runs by them in the background. They go to see what it was, only to find a possum in a locker. And I normally wouldn't mention something so inconsequential, but I love the story I learned about them shooting this. Apparently, they just got a possum and expected it to deliver the scares right away. But every time they tried to get the shot, the damn thing could only be adorable instead of scary. Aw, oh, what a little cutie. The kids keep looking, and eventually, they find the dirtiest little boy I have ever seen outside a coal mine, this kid named Jedediah. Can you walk like a person, Jed? No? Oh, that's okay. Promise you won't hurt me? Oh yeah, we promise, little buddy. As long as you don't attack us with the bone art you've got hanging around. Jedediah tells them that the sheriff is probably at home getting drunk, but since the roads don't go to his house, Aaron and Kemper have to walk through some beautifully lit woods to get there instead. Director Marcus Nispel has a painting background, and it really comes through in these shots. The sheriff's house they find is actually totally fucking awesome, from its stark architecture to the menacing way Daniel Pearl shoots it. Honestly, this is one of the coolest looking horror houses we've seen in quite some time. I mean, it's no Elm Street house, but what could ever be, right? In contrast to their 1974 counterparts, these kids don't break into the house all willy-nilly, and instead the door is answered by a guy named Monty, who's a double-leg amputee. Monty says that, nope, sheriff don't live here, dirty boy must have lied, and then allows Aaron, and only Aaron, into his house to call the police station. The police station tells her that the sheriff will be at the old mill soon. Keep your damn pants on. After Aaron's call ends, she hears Monty shouting for help. Looks like he fell over in the middle of drawing himself a mud bath. At least I hope that's mud. Ew. Monty takes advantage of Aaron's kindness, the nasty old man, while Kemper gets sick of waiting on the porch. Mom, I'm bored now. I want to come inside. He walks through a house that production designer Greg Blair dressed according to Ed Gein crime scene photos. But to me, it still doesn't feel as depraved as the original movie's production design done by Bob Burns. Kemper's tour is ended when Leatherface appears and sprays his blood across the TV, then drags him away to recreate a classic moment. Although Kemper was still kicking right there, I'm gonna put him on the kill count now, because the next time we see his face will be when Leather is hard at work turning it into a mask. Isn't it great when you find a hobby that you can really throw yourself into? Also, it's during this home ex scene later on that we get to clearly see Leather's unmasked adult face for the one and only time in the series. Looks like he wears a mask here because he has a skin condition? Remakes just love explaining stuff that doesn't really need explaining. Also, while we're talking about Leatherface, in this movie, he's played by by six foot five bodybuilder Andrew Bernarski, who was super into the role. I was born to wear the mask. There's nobody that's going to be as scary as me or bring what I could bring to this character. It kind of sounds like he might have been a little too into it, actually. I gotta play another face. I was born to wear the mask. <laughs> There was some weird stuff between him and Gunnar Hansen, too. The way Bernarski describes it, Hansen was cool to him on set for these prequel movies, but started throwing shade around in 2013, when Hansen was working on Texas Chainsaw 3D. And I did actually notice in the special features for that movie that Hansen was kind of talking shit. Yeah, this is the Andrew Bernarski slams the door. This is the original slams the door. Oh, okay. It was actually such an acrimonious relationship that when Gunnar Hansen died in 2015, the only response Andrew Bernarski had at first was a Facebook post saying boo-hoo. Wow, that was all really weird to learn. The noise from Kemper's attack gets Aaron's attention, and she leaves Monty to go look for her boyfriend, eventually leaving the house after she's unknowingly spied upon by Leatherface and his favorite sound effect. 
Back at the mill, the sheriff has finally arrived. And let me tell you something, son. Sheriff Hoyt is one mean motherfucker. As if Arlie Ermey's deep crevice frown and messy spitting didn't tip you off there. He's a suspiciously scary dude, both in the way he talks to the kids. Excuse me, you mind getting the fuck out of my way, son? And the way he'd be looking at that body. Wow. Look at that mess. His solution is simple, saran wrap. And he orders Andy to help him with the same kind of discipline you'd expect from a drunk dad in the 50s. She ain't gonna bite you, she's dead her in a goddamn doornail. Get a hold of her and pick her up. After being real gross and sexual with the body, with dialogue that Arlie Ermey was able to ad-lib because of course. I'm no stranger to bad guys. I play bad guys pretty often. It's a lot of fun to play the bad guy. Hoyt has Andy and Morgan carry the corpse to his police car and dump it in his trunk. You know, standard operating police procedure. Protect and serve. That's what we do. Yep, that's some good police. After he leaves, Erin finishes her second unexpected journey through the woods and gets back to the mill. She was hoping to find Kemper there, but since he isn't, the kids set out to look for him. All they find instead are a bunch of abandoned cars, some human teeth, like this the Blair Witch or some shit, and a picture of the hitchhiker who killed herself, sealed inside a jar full of, well, let's just call it lemonade and think no more about it. Because these people are hot teens in a horror movie, they decide to split up again, with Morgan and Pepper returning to the van, while Eric and Andy go to look for Kemper some more. They get back to that exceedingly well-shot house and decide that Aaron will distract Monty so Andy can sneak inside. That gives us a half-assed re-rendering, well, in one regard at least, of the famous low-angle shot from the original, while Andy has way too much fun ninjaing into the house. You know he's humming his own theme music like Kronk while he's doing this. He comes across the kitchen slash meat hanging slash chicken room where they keep their best human skin pantyhose, and he's made Majorly bummed when he finds out they don't have any good snacks in the fridge. God, no Sunny D or nothing? Andy causes a loud ass kitchen crash, and Aaron runs inside to make sure he's okay. He is, for now, but Monty says that's not gonna be true for long. Little turd. You're so dead you don't even know it. Show enough, behind door number one is Leatherface! And just like that, we're back in this shit. Aaron gets away and leaves Andy to run the first chainsaw chase, which includes a solid action bit involving a lug wrench and a beautiful detour through that old horror movie classic, Sheets on a Clothesline. Eventually, Leatherface cuts the race and Andy short by chainsawing through his shin. Inside the Hewitt house, after it gets dark, Leatherface peels the injured Andy off the ground and makes a sacrifice to the entity by sticking that boy on a meat hook. And sure, we've all seen that before, but I'll tell you what we haven't seen, Leatherface salting a stump and wrapping it up like a porterhouse for supper. Number 49, your order is up. Aaron gets back to the van, which very inconveniently won't start for them, when Sheriff Hoyt suddenly reappears. She mistakenly gets her hopes up, thinking he can help her, but Hoyt ain't about to help a van full of hedonist stoners. You kids taking drugs? He gets them out of the vehicle and makes them lie on the ground, then scares the piss out of them by shooting near their heads. Well, he's either fucking with them or he's got shit for aim. Either way, Pepper's lost all hope. We're gonna die, we're gonna die. Hoyt takes Morgan inside the van and torments him by making him reenact a hitchhiker's suicide, getting a little sexual with it while he does. Show me how she did it, please. Do it! It's an intense scene, and actor Jonathan Tucker actually made himself throw up for multiple takes of him shoving the gun further into his mouth. When Hoyt gets momentarily distracted, Morgan manages to turn the gun around on him, but looks like the sheriff saw that coming. Oh, you saw in big doo-doo this time, Morgan. Hoyt takes the van's keys and hauls Morgan off for attempted cop killing. Maybe write yourself a DUI while you're at it, Hoyt. Although, I guess you needed that bottle, because what else are you going to smash against Morgan's face? <laughs> oh, that was... Really rude, wasn't it? Yeah, it really was, dude. And not in the fun, demented way, like Drayton with his poking stick. You're just fucking scary, man. They get to the Hewitt house, still lit like it's a Coachella tent, and Hoyt engages in some standard police brutality as he manhandles Morgan into the house. Back at the mill, Erin is trying to hotwire the van with skills she learned in juvie, when Leatherface attacks them with skills he learned in Chainsaw Junior High. He graduated top of his class. Pepper makes a run for it and does her best Donkey Kong to slow him down. But the 
those barrels don't stop this barrel-chested lad, who catches up to her and cuts her to the ground. He kills her by cutting her in half just off-screen, which is a pretty bland kill for Pepper. Could have definitely used more seasoning. The feathers from Pepper's jacket fill the air as Leatherface looks back towards Aaron while wearing Kemper's face. Very eerie shot. Partly because of the face, partly because of the feathers. Now it's Aaron's turn to make a run for it and begin another chainsaw chase through the woods. Vroom, vroom, vroom. We've all seen this before. Aaron ends her lap at a trailer home where she's led inside by a sickly looking woman named Henrietta and her presumed mother, known only as the Tea Lady. Why is she the Tea Lady? Cause this a tea trailer, motherfuckers. Nothing a good old cup of tea won't settle. Yeah, except like cannibalism. But from what these ladies are saying, they're not worried about any chainsaw attacks. In fact, when they talk about Leatherface, they sound like friggin' Chelsea. Poor sweet boy. Sweet boy. Henrietta forces Aaron to drink some of her famous tea and then goes to tend to a crying baby. Oh, she's a colicky one, huh? Aaron realizes why that baby's such a poopy pants when she sees a picture of her with a different family. That's not your baby. You stole her! How very clever of Aaron. If only she hadn't let them pour tea down her gullet, then maybe she'd be able to get out of there. But she did, so she isn't. Live and let learn, I suppose. She's woken up by Sheriff Hoyt pouring beer on her face, and we see the main members of the Hewitt family all together at last. There's Hoyt, his mama Luda May, that woman from the general store, her brother Monty, the guy who was feeling up that Beal booty in the bathroom, and Luda May's grandson Jedediah, the amazing dirt wonder. And of course, there's Leatherface, whose real name in this timeline is Thomas Brown Hewitt. Luda May yells at Aaron, while young little Jed begs his grandma not to hurt the nice lady from 7th Heaven. Leatherface throws Aaron into the basement, which has now flooded for no other reason I can think of than to have Jessica Beale be all wet. Wonder if that was a suggestion by producer Michael Bay after he had her wash his car or some shit. Aaron finds Andy pretty much crucified on a meat hook, and in fact for this scene, actor Mike Vogel had to endure five hours hanging up on a painful harness system. Ouch. Maybe you could help him off that thing, Aaron? Yeah, just like that. Oh, oh God, never mind. Now it's worse. Sorry. Yeah, you should be. Andy begs Aaron to put him out of his misery, and when she finally agrees to do it, she goes about it in the dumbest way possible. She just stabs him in the gut. Come the fuck on. Who would ever be that dumb? At least aim for the heart. You can still take a shower in his blood all the same, Aaron, only he won't be dying a torturously slow death. Ugh. Aaron then finds Morgan having a spot of tub time and looks like he's still alive too. She helps him out as Jedediah appears and tells them to follow him to safety. But right as they start to, oh, it's fucking Leatherface! We're in his chainsaw blade and chasing them through this narrow underground corridor. Aaron and Morgan manage to escape Leatherface and the subterranean meat cellar with a little assistance from Jedediah. Good dirty boy. They flee the Hewitt house and limp their way into a nearby building, but when they're unable to find any exits, I guess nobody's repaired any generators, Aaron has to stuff Morgan Morgan into a cubby and then hide on her own, since Leatherface has followed them inside and is eager to make his family proud. He hole punches the wall to get at her and is all ready to cut her in half with his chainsaw when Morgan stops him with a body slam. They wrestle around for a while and Aaron tries to help, but Leatherface wins the handicap match and pins Morgan up on a spiky chandelier. Way to improvise a meat hook, Tommy boy. Leatherface kills Morgan by taking his saw up between his legs while Aaron scrambles away. Aaron's back on the track and although this is like the bazillionth chainsaw chase we've seen, at least Daniel Pearl gives us some pretty handsome shots to look at while we watch the same old action, which includes Leatherface falling and cutting himself, just like he did on the road at the end of the first movie. Aaron makes it to an actual meatpacking plant, which is great, because we always hear so damn much about slaughterhouses in these movies that it's about time we see one in person, especially if it's replacing the overdone dinner scene. My only complaint is that apparently the Hewitts didn't own this meat packing plan. Because if they did, they could have been the Hewitt Packers. Leatherface follows Aaron into the plant, chasing her through rooms full of Hellraiser hooks and freezers full of dead meat. And she thought they smelled bad on the outside. Also, since production couldn't afford that many slabs of fake meat, those are actual cow carcasses they're using here. Probably not the best experience for Jessica Beale, who's a longtime vegan. And to make matters worse for her, she's unable to get through this chase scene without getting needlessly wet again. Damn, girl, you must be freezing in there. Aaron arms herself with a cleaver and hides in a locker as Leatherface walks around looking like a badass. Yeah, that's a pretty cool fucking Leatherface shot. Her locker camping strategy works and she's able to jump out with the cleaver and hack into Leatherface's 
arm. She hacks the thing right off, in fact, and leaves Leatherface behind with only one arm. Aw, oh, and the one he lost was his chainsawing arm, too? That's gonna affect his livelihood, Aaron. Aaron escapes into the wet, wet night and flags down a semi-truck for help. And in a rare moment of relief for the paranoid watchers among us, the driver doesn't end up being a Sawyer or Hewitt. But he does get weirded out by Aaron, who mutters like that hitchhiker did, and similarly screams when she sees that they're headed back to the barbecue store. When the driver pulls off and parks at the store, Aaron gets out and runs around back, where she sees through the window the Hewitts all together, fawning over that stolen baby of Henrietta's. The truck driver inadvertently distracts them when he asks for help with the whole Aaron situation, and while he talks to the Hewitts, Aaron snatches the baby up. Sorry, Henrietta, but you know what they say about babies. Easy come, easy go. As Aaron hotwires another vehicle, Sheriff Hoyt approaches the semi-truck, and some sneak see hobbits' editing leaves you thinking that he's about to open that door to find Aaron. But she's not in the truck. Instead, she hotwired his sheriff's car and runs him over like a motherfucker with it. Fuck you! <laughs> right? And she's all about that double tap, too. Wait, scratch that. She's going for the triple tap. Damn! One, two, three. He is out. Aaron drives away with that stranger baby, hopefully to help it and not sell it on the dark web or anything. And although Leatherface gives her a parting glance with his chainsaw, it's really only so he can half-assedly recreate the famous final shot from the original. The movie ends with a return to that framing device of the police footage, even though it feels entirely unnecessary at this point. Or rather it would, except it gives us two more kids kills after Leatherface pops out and kills the cop on camera as well as the cam-op cop. The crime scene was not properly secured by Travis County Police. Two investigating officers were fatally wounded that day. See? The proof is in the Laracat. Two more kills for the cop. Thanks, John. And, you know, Leatherface. How many kills did the Hewitts do it to it? Let's find out at the numbers. <laughs> Eight people died in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake, beating out the original thanks to those last two kills. The victims consisted of two women, five men, and one unknown cam op, though statistically, he'd probably be a dude. With a runtime of 98 minutes, we had a kill on average every 12.25 minutes. I'll give the Golden Chainsaw for coolest kill to the Hitchhiker for sure. It's a pretty promising start to the movie, what with the shock of it all, and of course, that kick-ass shot. The only thing I don't love is the way she was holstering that gun. Seems kinda silly to me. Doll Machete for lamest kill will go to Andy, because I still can't believe Aaron decided to mercy kill her friend with a slow-ass motherfucking gut stab. Come on! And that's it. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre reboot came out in 2003 and earned enough money that a prequel was made to give us more of the Hewitt family. I'll look at that next week, but until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching The Kill Count for the Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake. I want to thank a bunch of patrons this week, like Jessica Diora, Aaron Cornelia, Alan Crazy Horse, Zay Johnson, Anthony Bjorn Green, and Papa Steve. By the time you're watching this, I'll be in Las Vegas, celebrating my birthday. I'm 30. I'm old. How'd you feel about the TCM remake? Let me know in the comments. Thanks, everybody. Be good people.